Good morning, church. I feel really burdened with that long introduction. And uh, I don't know, I, I feel like I'm a very important person standing up here. But uh, to tell you the truth, I'm only a servant, uh, following and obeying and doing the things which my boss up there asked me to do. So that's exactly who we are. And uh, as this morning, I'm going to talk. Well, uh, first of all, I just like to explain a little bit about uh, we have a family here, uh, and uh, the whole family was introduced uh, this morning. So we are global diaspora family spread and scattered all over. But uh, we have a, a conviction. Uh, wherever we are, Lord uses us according to his purpose. So uh, every time we meet, uh, we are able to feel like, yes, God has used us in a mighty way, and all the glory that we just give it back to him. Well, on the right hand, uh, I wasn't always like that when I was serving in Indonesia, but from time to time, when I have to travel to uh, the Madris village, and you know, the some, uh, Madris people are very, um, a fundamental and radical groups within Indonesia. So men like myself, you have to have a mustache and uh, a little beard in order to be a worthy person to at least open up a conversation. So uh, I don't know how many of you know about the, the Korean traits, but uh, you know, the Koreans don't have much of uh, what's up here. <laughs> So I have to grow that uh, for about a week. And sometimes I have to use my wife's, uh, you know, the pencil to draw eyebrow <laughs> to get little assistance. But uh, uh, looking back, uh, all things God has done, has done wonderfully. And then uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful uh, that we are still being used as God's instrument. Well, this morning I'd like to open with a little story, a story of a pastor. Now, this pastor is a well-known pastor in some town, so everybody knows that uh, he's a pastor. One day he was walking down the street, and he saw a crowd of these little children circled around, having such a great fun, laughter after laughter. So he got curious. He walked over, put his head inside the, you know, the little circle group, and trying to find out what's going on. To their surprise, because they all know he's a pastor, and pastor asked them, what are you playing? And one boy has certainly said, oh, pastor, we are playing this lying game. You know, telling lies. And uh, there was another boy who was holding a puppy and goes, whoever tells the most crafty and most creative lie well, get this puppy as a prize. Hearing this, pastor got very furious and he started to rebuke the children. And he said, oh, children, you shouldn't play such a game. It's bad to play lying games. And he kind of put his chest out a little and said, you know, when I was your age, I was such a good boy. I haven't even lied once. Hearing this, these boys and girls were kind of looking at one another, and finally, a boy who was holding a puppy was decided. He looked at the pastor and said, Pastor, here, you won the prize. <laughs> you know, this story tells us that we are sinners, right? Bible say, there is no one righteous, not even one. We all are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. But then, on another hand, we say to one another, we are righteous. We are righteous. Why? We are righteous because the Lord Jesus Christ has shed his blood on the cross, and whoever believes in him, all sins are forgiven, and we have right to come before the presence of God and enter into his grace. So we are righteous. But are we really righteous? Now, we're all sitting here praising and worship God this morning. But 
Go ahead, examine yourselves. Are you righteous? After you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't sin anymore. You became, all of a sudden, you become a holy person. Walk holy, and you eat holy. Are you really holy and righteous? Well, that's why Bible say we are righteous sinner or redeemed sinner. You know, is this terminology seems like it's contradictory. Righteous sinner is a righteous sinner. Well, yes, we are righteous sinners. Even though we are called righteous, but there's a sinful state that still remains in us. We are going through the stages of sanctification. We are called righteous because of the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ that has washed our sins away. We are still struggling every day to follow after the steps of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me uh, go on to read. Uh, in fact, I haven't even uh, read uh, the, uh, the Bible verse. So let us, uh, the, well, the, in one uh, uh, unison voice, let's all read it together. First Thessalonians 1, 4 to 8. Okay, begin. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a mother to all the believers in Macedonia and Archaea. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only Macedonia and Archaea, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. Well, okay, we have defined who we are. We are redeemed sinner. So go ahead, tell one another, and you have to stress redeemed and say in a small voice, sinner, okay? We are redeemed sinner. You know, that redeemedness, that righteousness is more powerful than our sinful nature that we still carry on. And we are walking toward the direction which one day we will stand in victory along with our Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm going to uh, show you a little story because uh, can we go to the next one? Now, isn't that an amazing, you know, how many of you, uh, let me see the other hand, how many of you have seen that movie? You know, that's been around so long. Okay, I see hands all around. Whether you're young or old, that movie has given us such a, a great impression. The Pixar uh, is no longer just a cartoon. You know, it's a live cartoon. It's an animation cartoon. Anyway, we have Woody and Buzz Lightyear. Um, I'm going to, uh, one day, you know, I was watching the movie with my children when we were serving in Indonesia. Uh, from time to time, I spend a good amount of family time with my children, so we watch movie or we do some activities together. One day, we were watching that movie, and the one particular scene that really impressed me so much, I said, oh, children, hold on, rewind, rewind, I want to watch that again. But you know, the kids, they all understand the whole th movie, and we are the slow ones. So they want to go on, so I say, oh, come on, come on, like, rewind, but they didn't want to. So we had to watch the whole movie, and after they left, I have to put it back on again and watch that scene, and it really impressed me. I'm going to bring that scene to your memory oh, uh, this time. Buzz and Woody, you know, two completely different characters cannot match, but somehow the writer put them together to be the most, uh, or the, the main character. Remember, they got captured. And Woody is inside the milk carton. And Buzz was out there, you know, tied around with a rocket. And they were in despair, no hope. And they almost gave up. But then, slowly, Buzz looked 
at the bottom of his foot. And he found out there's a writing on there. Remember that scene? What's the writing? Andy, okay, someone cried out Andy. Well, I hope you, uh, you can also memorize Bible as well as the name. <laughs> Andy, who's Andy? Andy is the owner, owner of these toys. You know, the thought that, oh, we have someone who loves us, who cares for us, who would just chase after us if he had known that we'd been captured. You know, this thought of Andy, the one who owns them, gave them revival. There's a real revival going on right there in the midst. And it gave them new motivation to escape. And we know the whole story as well. You know, they, they, they are successful in their uh, escape route. And it gave me a thought, wow, what a story. So I was thinking, oh, do I have that riding in me? So I'm going to ask you a same question this morning. Go ahead, take a look at the bottom of your foot, see what it says. Go ahead, take a look at it. What does it say? Made in China? <laughs> well, most of the, the you know, industry these days comes from China, so maybe it's made in China or made in Indonesia. Or... But in reality, you know, I can't ask you to open up your chest, but the inscription of Jesus is not written on the bottom of your foot, but it is inscripted into your heart. Well, not just is inscripted into your heart. Jesus dwells within your heart. And you know what God says? Every morning, God says, you are mine. You are wonderfully and fearfully made. You are God's Wonderful masterpiece creation of crown of creation. God loves you. And that very thought that we have an owner. You know, you all are owned by the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not alone. We are no longer alone. God fights for us. Remember the song that we were singing? Yes, God fights for us. We are not alone. You are owned by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that gives us motivation not only to do things as according to the purpose of our God, but we are also able to do the things beyond our imagination, beyond our capacity. Why? Because God is able and God will make us do the things that will give us greater ability than who we are and what we can do. So here, God say, you are mine. It's the relationship. You know, we have the relationship, not with somebody else, but the creator. God who created everything. God who is most powerful. God who rules this world. But we have a personal touch and relationship with him. Intimacy. Day after day after day, we are able to come before His throne with confidence. And that's exactly what God made us. And that's where our motivation comes. To do what? To do according to God's purpose. So, here, God's word. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. And Ephesians 2.10 Let's read it together. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you believe in that? Amen. So, well, let's uh, continue on with next verse. We all understand that we are made as God's channels of blessing, and that will... Uh, make us do the things and that put an implication of what we can do for 21st century. But if we go on to the next verse, verse uh, 5, this is what it said. Because our gasp, gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. 
And you know how we lived among you for your sake. Paul is now saying, writing to his Thessalonian Christian brothers and sisters, reminding them how gospel entered among them. And he's saying, remember people, gospel came to you not simply with words. Gospel cannot enter into somebody's heart with an articulation or persuasion or rhetorical skills. It is far bigger than that. If you are able to persuade someone, maybe you can win business. Maybe you can uh, get a, a big profit. But to open somebody's heart, it doesn't only happen with words. So, he goes on to say, but with the power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. In other words, this is work of God. When gospel comes, and the work of the gospel that brings into another region and opens up the hearts of people so that they are able to gather together and worship the living God takes place when God works. So, if we are able to read uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 26 to 27, let's all read it together. From Atalia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Now you can bring this scene into probably our setting. Missionaries from DUMC went and served overseas. And after certain years, they came back and they are giving report. So people all gather together to hear the report. And you know, the report that Paul and Barnabas gave to the church of Antioch, remember chapter 13 in the front part, they went out from church of Antioch. And now, in the 14, after their first journey, they came back and giving a report to the Antioch church. And that's exactly the a report they gave. They gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them. What does that tell you? Work of mission is not work of human being. All that God has done through them what God had done, God was able to give them the direction, where to go, what to do, and whom to see. Every single detail of ministry was directed by God. So they are not able to say, this is what I have done. They are not able to uh, uh, boast, say, you know, I have built a big project here and there where some of the missionaries might be able to do these days. But... It is work of God. It's not a work of human being. And Paul was able to make that very clear to the church what God had done. And number two, oh, no, no, go back there. And number two, he says, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Now, who is opening a door to non-believers? Is it the word that we speak? According to the Bible, it's really God who opens the door. God who is able to maneuver. God who is able to plan all things. And according to his time and according to his plans, God opens the door. And God makes all things possible. So there, number one is work of God. But Paul doesn't only say it's work of God. There's second part to it. So let's go to the number two, second venue. Paul, at the end of, uh, of verse 5, and this is what he say. You know people, um, okay, here, you know how we lived among you for your sake. He's writing a letter, reminding them, remember people when I was with you, the kind of life I used to live? See, it's the transparent life that he was able to show. Let me remind you, you know what? Paul prayed the most in the Bible. If you look at the Bible and try to uh, find out 
Paul prayed not for the power that will come down so that he will be a great evangelist and the fire will come down from heaven and someday as he preaches there was a power encounter that would happen miracle would happen and people will all gather together that's not the kind of thing Paul prayed for but Paul prayed for himself Paul prayed that he will be the worthy vessel before God so that what he does is not only be a hypocrisy but become a true work of God through him that he will become a vessel an instrument which God uses so uh, if we go to the uh, um, I don't know how many of you have uh, a fish tank in your house go ahead raise your hand if you have fish tank I see some hands over there here and you know some of you might even have a, a bigger aquarium but whatever you have, you know, we used to have uh, a fish tank uh, when we were serving in Indonesia. And every morning I was sitting, you know, doing my devotion. But at the same time, I kind of gave a food to the fish. And I started to talk to the fish. Can you imagine talking to a fish? You know, goldfish or whatever fish that swims inside the fish tank and you start to talk to them. And can you ever imagine when you talk to a fish, the fish will understand and respond back to you. I don't think so. But sometimes I, I you know, I, I imagine I, I'm like a fish in the tank. There are people out there always look at me and observing me, what I do, how I think, and how I do activities is all transparently known to them. Living in Indonesia, if I go outside and start to speak in Bahasa, immediately they will ask me, Aslimana, where are you from? Because my pronunciation is not like Indonesian nor Chinese Indonesian either. And you know, there's something strange about this guy, so they will start to ask me, where are you from? And then uh, I have to go through a long history because I've been diaspora for 40 years. Even though I'm Korean, maybe I'm not really Korean either. So I have to, you know, dig up all this history and start to explain to, uh, to them. Of course, you know, sometimes that opens up a wonderful conversation so that I can share the gospel. Anyway, I feel like, you know, a fish inside a fish tank because Every time I walk out the door, and you know, there, there was a predominantly Muslim community, and everybody was watching me. Especially these days, you know how the Korean wave, you know, pe you know, people are so fond of all the Korean food and Korean fashion and Korean sports and Korea everything. After they knew that I was Korean, they were all watching me, what I am doing, what kind of food I'm eating, you know, what kind of life I'm living. So, I was living a transparent life. So it was very important what I, and how I live, the kind of being that I am, rather than what I do. And that's what our God counts from all the gospel preachers. Paul prayed that his inner being would change and his character building would come to a worthy of God's calling so that he might be able to appear before the people that he wants to bring gospel, not as a dominant person, but as a servant, that the fruit of the Spirit might show in his life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's what Paul worked after day after day, and he prayed after. What I want to do, I do not end up doing. What I do not want to do, I do. Oh, how wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this sinful nature? He was crying, crying out to God, and he was working on his character so that God will use him in a mighty way. People, church, it's not what we do that's important, but it's who we are and how we appear as Christ-like people. 
that become a great tool of evangelism, that become great tool for mission. So we go on to the next point. Next point. Um, verse 6. Very interesting. The surroundings or the situation for gospel workers. And this is what he says, verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. You see, history of a church is a history of suffering and tribulation. Now, suffering, you know, I, I, I open these days, officiate a wedding. And sometimes I give a, a message to a newlywed couple. There are three kinds of rings. I don't know if you know this. But let me tell you, there are three kinds of rings. One is engagement ring. The other one is wedding ring. And the third ring is suffering. <laughs> but the Bible is not talking about this kind of suffering within the house. Of course, you know, you have to work each other to build a godly family. And that takes a little suffering, especially for your husbands. It takes lots of suffering for you. Oh, this might also work for you uh, our wives as well. But what the Bible is talking about here is suffering. What comes from outside? Attack. Satan attacks us. If we Christians want to live a holy life, it's not going to be easy. Because Satan is not going to stop us. It's not going to make us live the kind of life, a well life. You see, Satan attacks us in various different ways. These days we heard about ISIS, Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And I pour my heart out how Satan is attacking us in a very cruel, real cruel ways. When we were serving in Indonesia, there were uh, some uh, attacks among the uh, Christian villages by the radical Muslims. But at least back then, about 10, 15 years ago, back then, they attacked the village and they killed the parents in front of the kids, but they would never kill the kids. And these kids end up uh, that uh, some organizations that we were working together opened up an orphanage and they came to an orphanage and then later we saw a great man and woman of God grew up from these orphanages. Suffering gave them greater strength and direction where to go. Now, Satan knows. So these days, when we see the stories of ISIS, what's happening? You know, they are killing children in front of the eyes of, of parents. Or worse than that, there's a genocide. They are killing whole villages, everyone, even infants. And that's the kind of world we are living in. World so cruel. And the sufferings and tribulations and persecutions and trials are coming all around. But you know what? Paul gives us greater hope. Because in spite of severe suffering, what does the next line say? There's a wonderful word that we all enjoy to hear. Paul uses these two words side by side, and he just takes joy using this word, joy. Right? Rejoice always, and again I say unto you, rejoice. Suffering and joy, two words. Meanings are opposite to one another. You cannot match those two words together, but in our faith, we are able to match two words together because it goes very well side by side. Why? Because there's an inner joy that's within us, joy that's unexplainable, joy that our Lord Jesus Christ put in our heart, planted in our heart, and joy that no one will be able to take away and no matter how difficult the life is, no matter how suffering will surround us, we are able to overcome it because our Lord Jesus Christ will stand alongside us, make us win the victory together with us. That's who we are. 
victorious together with our Lord Jesus Christ. And that joy brings us greater victory after victory. And that's why missionaries and Christian workers were able to go on and continue their ministry for the last 2,000 years. And I know that this ministry will go on forever until the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we are, joy. And let me give you some stories. You know, this uh, is a, a story uh, that uh, as a, a director of mission organization, I travel extensively. About six months out of a year, I, I travel different places. And now China is changing, but several years ago when I went to China, uh, the house churches, house churches are, are growing and becoming so strong. And I have seen that house church leaders are very young. You know, in their late 20s and early 30s, you know, they became house church leaders and God specially appeared to them and then how they are able to work effectively. It's just amazing. And some of the house churches, and you know, the one, one story that uh, I was able to observe uh, when I went to Sichuan province, there was a house church that was growing so big. So the Chinese police, as an example to many other churches that might grow, uh, grow uh, the, to become even bigger uh, influence, they capture the pastor and put him into jail. Now, just imagine if uh, Dr. Daniel Ho will be, you know, one day put into jail because of what he's doing as a senior pastorship. What would you do? Would you all run away? Eh? Would you all say, oh, I have nothing to do with DUMC. Now, big persecution will come, so let me just hide. And I have no membership whatsoever with DUMC. Is that what you're going to do? Exactly not. That's exactly what's happening when the persecution comes. So believers would gather together and start to pray even more fervently. And this will give them greater spirituality and greater vision for what they need to do. So churches start to grow. Well, the leader was inside the jail. And Chinese police have sinned. So they let go the pastor. The pastor came out and saw the whole situation. While he was in prison, the church grew big. And the house no longer can contain them. So they went out to the field and even to the mountain. And the church was going with a greater fervency. So he went back to the police and said, let me go back into jail. <laughs> jail cell, you know, very cold and isolated, but pastor and the leader was able to take that position for sake of the kingdom of God. That's where the joy comes and overcome the suffering. And there's so many stories that I am able to uh, share with you. Um, the, the, let me, uh, I'm not going to tell where it is. It's someplace in the Middle East. Christian uh, members are growing, and this is also house church, and many of the uh, places where we call the creative access nations. You know, C-A-N. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm hearing so many can, can here in this country. What does can can do? You are able to do it, right? But uh, why do we use Creative Access Nations, C A N, instead of uh, saying it's closed country or restricted country? We say once we use our creativity, you know, God has given us creativity, God has given us ingenuity. And once we start to use that, there are no closed doors. God is able to open any places with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we call it Creative Access Nations. Now, there's some of the Creative Access Nations have house churches, and they are growing in the midst of suffering. And there's one place in the Middle East that believers gather together in the house, worshiping God, praising God, but they are singing not too loudly. Why? Because house next door might hear them. And they are afraid that uh, the, the religious police might come. So they start to sing very slowly with a, 
uh, with a small voice, but this could not contain, you know, what, what is in their heart and then a joy and, and just a desire to worship God just could not contain them. So one leader, one day, say to all these different house church leaders, go learn how to drive bus. Because your ordinary uh, driver's license cannot drive big bus. So they went and started to learn how to drive bus. So on Sundays, house church leaders go and rent a big bus, 40 seaters or 50 seaters. They would go around, pick up the believers. And usually they go out to the field where there are no ones or, you know, the, among the valleys. And they would worship God as loud as they want to. Why? Because their heart want to worship and praise God. You know, it's a great privilege this morning as you're able to sing and praise and worship God. And some of you are jumping. You don't know how wonderful privilege it is for you. And you must use it wisely. You must use it for the glory of God. And you must just sing with all your heart when you want to sing. Because in the future, you might be put in a situation where you cannot sing and worship God like you want to do. Because there are many places in the world that people are still want to just express their love to God, but not able to do so in a worthy manner. So let me continue on. Last verse, and this is what it says. And so you became a mother to all the believers in Macedonia and Archaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Archaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. Became a mother. Very important. I heard about the UMC, and I heard about Dr. Daniel Ho way before I came to Malaysia. Your senior pastor is very famous, not because he does his own thing, but he, because he serves God. That's why he's famous. That's why we believe that he's a model to many church leaders all around the world, because his model is the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect Lord Jesus Christ. You know, many of us are following after certain mothers. If you are following the world, who is your mother? Maybe some rich person or sports stars or fashion stars. You know what materialism is? Let me give you a definition of materialism. Materialism is buying things that you don't even want with the money that you don't even have to impress a person that you don't even like. Did you get it? You want to repeat one more time? Materialism is buying things that you don't even want with money, plastic, that you don't need money that you don't even have to impress a person you don't even like. And they are chasing after the sandcastle, something that is not there, but that's what they are chasing after. But you know who we are chasing after? We are chasing after Jesus Christ our perfect model. We, that's why we call ourselves Christians, Christ-likeness. And when we follow after the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what happens? This news are ringing out. Wonderful news of what's happening in Thessalonian church started to spread out and rang out all around the region of Archaea and Macedonia. Um, next one. Uh, okay, there, there it is. The perfect uh, model, son of man, the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. But in early church, Jerusalem church, guess what's happening? Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When the church was biblically found, was able to do and obey what God wants them to do, God added to their number and the influence would start to go out and spread out and makes a changes in a community, the society that we want to change, 
we are able to do so. Not because who we are, because what, how God will be able to use us. So important thing is that we follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a good news, wonderful news of great martyrs that will start to happen here. Changes that will take place. Transformation, true transformation that will take, start to take place. And that's what God does. God wants to use every single church, the community of believers, to stand firm so that we are able to bring changes all around us. But even greater than that, even greater than that, not just changes in outward ways, changes within the hearts of people who need to hear the gospel. That's the most important thing that we need to do. Church stands, and it is will of God to do mission because we have God of mission. God have this life-changing gospel, good news, but God wants to use every single one of us as an instrument to bring that out so that we are able to change the world. And passing it on and continue to pass it out, that's why we are here for. We are not here to come in Sundays and just have a celebration. Certainly, through the celebration, and it's very important too, but through the celebration and also through your cell group, you will start to go through a transformation. But that transformation is not for your sake. You are the vessels which God uses, channels of God's wonderful blessings, and God wants to use you as a blessing to the whole nations so that through you, the whole world may know who God is. Not that they want to know what the UMC is, but through the UMC, the whole world will know who God is. That's why we are standing here for. That's why the UMC exists, so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ will be lifted up through the UMC. There's a church in Brazil. I know the, 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 uh, the Daniel and Doris just came back from uh, Brazil. There's a church in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, Iglesia Aqua Viva, Living Water. And this church has a very intentional method of reaching out to the community. You know, Brazil is known for its crime rate, especially young people, very idle, have nothing to do, and there's a full of corruption so that they have given up hope. But this church sitting in the middle of downtown, open the back door, and it's a uh, praise and worship team, and you, you know, your praise and worship team, you are very important. Praise and worship team sings, and this wonderful music rings out to the back door into the streets. You know, Brazilians are known for samba dance, right? When they hear this music, Somehow they are attracted, and somehow they, you know, there's a magnetic force that brings them in. So they would just walk across and then enjoy, but slowly, one by one, they would come in and start to sit at the back. But you know what works? Word of God works effectively in their heart. And once the Word of God enters into their heart, they would start to come toward the middle and toward the front. So blessed are all those people that are sitting in front. <laughs> Word of God ringing out, bringing changes and affecting the lives of people. Let me just give you a uh, uh, simple, uh, the, I know the, I don't have much time, just two stories, uh, because these stories are uh, something that God uses uh, and maybe it will give you uh, a picture of what's going on and how God works uh, in today's world. In India, and I don't want to uh, name this person, but uh, in India, my very good friend, whom we studied together for the Theological Seminary in uh, Pasadena, this person went back to India, and as he was preparing to do the work, he started out with prayer. Lord, 
Show me the way that I am able to change this society, where I am able to bring the gospel to the people who do not know you. And after uh, several years of prayer, and when you pray, God answers, right? So when you pray, God answers. So God gave him a wisdom. And this was about uh, 10 years ago, so I don't know, some of you might not even know what cassette tape recorder is. How many of you know what cassette is? Okay, good number of you, good, I don't have to. You know, he made a drama, Bible stories. Storytelling is now becoming a very good tool to reach out to the people, especially those people who are illiterate, you know, people who cannot read. But not only people who cannot read, but everybody even who reads, storytelling is a very effective tool. So we have oral Bible. So he put Bible story and made it into a drama and then put that in either Hindi or Bengali or maybe even Tamil and then put into the areas of the people where their languages are respectively uh, to the languages that they are fond of. And people saw there's a cassette. Out of curiosity, they start to take cassette, and inside the house, they have cassette record players. They put it in and start to listen in their own mother tongue. You know, the mother tongue is very important here. In their own mother tongue, they are hearing stories. So they are soaked into the story and listening what's going on. And when the story is at climax, it ends and say, look for the next tape. <laughs> oh, they got so curious. They want to hear what's going on, the next story, and they were searching all over and asking around, where can we find the next tape? A few days later, the next tape appears and then, you know, kind of uh, distributed or uh, put it on street corners. They found the next tape and happily they take the tape, goes back to their house, listen. And the story continues, and they are listening to the story, and their hearts are stirred up. And at climax, story ends. They say, look for the next tape. The same thing goes on for uh, tape three, tape four. But let me tell you, how does faith come? By hearing the word of God, right? And by storytelling, there's a word of God, there's a gospel, there's a ch life-changing stories. And these people are responding, where can we know more about this? And that's when the workers would go in, gather people, and make a Bible study groups, which later become house churches. How God used these stories after stories and how gospel is spreading out by faithful workers. One more, and I know the time's almost up. There's a place called Djibouti. Uh, some of you might have heard about this country. Now, this country uh, is situated in Africa. In Africa, there's a place called Horn of Africa. You know, the place looked like a horn. Actually, the, it's, uh, Somalia is there, and Ethiopia is there. And right between Somalia and Ethiopia, on the northern, northern side, there's a country called Djibouti. And if you cross the water from there, uh, which is uh, the Gulf of Aden, and then there's a Yemen on the other side of Arabian Peninsula. Now in Djibouti, missionaries went in. But you know these days, missionaries come in variety of colors. I'm a missionary and I represent yellow color. And there are brown color missionaries, of course, you know, well, before we had a predominantly white color missionaries, but these days, God brings all different colors of missionaries, using them in a mighty way. Missionaries entered into Djibouti. And they shared the gospel to the predominantly Muslim community. People responded. Many people were overjoyed with the stories they heard. And they are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, when, uh, what their responses are? They say, did your ancestors also believe in the Lord Jesus? With an intention. If your ancestors believed in this Lord, why didn't they come earlier to my ancestors to tell them about this good news? Because that's how good the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ is. 
But many of those different color missionaries are first generation believers. So they say, no, unfortunately, my ancestors also were like in darkness, but I'm the first one who heard this great news. And I'm also the first one who came out from my country, left my home country to tell you this good news. So now it's your turn that you must also bring this gospel to another place. And that's how the gospel continued to spread out. Church, you have responsibility. Blessings we all have is not for us to contain. We have blessings. And it is for us to enjoy, but at the same time, we must pass it on. Because God is asking us to pass it on. There are people in our workplace, there are people in our, you know, amongst our neighbors, schools, or wherever you are. Or maybe there are someone who might have compelled to take this gospel to a places where, a place called unreached people groups, because there are still unreached peoples that need to hear the gospel amongst us. God is asking every single one of us, if you have this good news, it's not only for you to enjoy, it is there for you to pass it on. Because once we start to pass it on, lives will come to the Lord Jesus Christ where there's no worship existed, worship starts to happen. And that's a glorious scene that we want to see. So the UMC church, I am going to give you this challenge. Mission is not just once a year activity. Mission need to be everyday activities in our lives. The, our character changes take place and we start to influence the people around us. But actively, we also need to pray for the person that we are able to reach out and start to share the gospel. And amongst you, there might even be a person who will leave Malaysia, carry the, uh, carry the Bible and gospel, and bring to the people that need to hear the gospel. Won't you respond? Won't you join the great movement of this mission which God is still working in the heart? And God's heart to be his mission. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We know your heart be this mission. You have given your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. That became the greatest news ever on the face of this world. And Father, for the last 2,000 years, this church has been expanded. Work of your kingdom has been spread out. People passed on one after another and after another. This great news where the transformation has taken place all over the world. And Father, you're still searching for people who would obey and follow the command which you have given to us. And here we are, DUMC, full of believers who wants to follow and obey and do the work for your kingdom. So here we are, Father. Use us. Use us in a mighty way. Take pleasure in us and be glorified. Thank you, Father. And I pray this in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ.